Good afternoon. Afternoon, sir. All right. Good afternoon. Afternoon, sir. Looks like all the regulars, so. So I guess uh, welcome, welcome everybody to uh, the first of our 2019-2020 uh, lecture series. Uh, definitely want to thank. Uh, this year we started doing sponsorships for the lectures. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, Socrates was out there. Uh, George and Amelia, thank you for your sponsorship. And uh, no problem. And, uh, My pleasure. Our pleasure. <laughs> Carl and uh, Marshall back there also just sponsored today, so we have a couple. We have we have a couple of cool uh, lectures coming up. Uh, so if anybody, anybody else would also like to sponsor, we do have sponsorship forms out on the table. You can take, pick one up, take a look at it. Uh, we do have some cool lectures coming up uh, in, uh, on the 20th of October. Uh, where Stuart Johnson is coming back with the uh, World War II music presentation that he's done here in the past. It's been very popular and. We've had people ask to have him come back, so he'll be coming back. Uh, we'll also, that morning, there'll be uh, our WOW Rosie the Rooter chapter. We'll be having a meeting here that morning, so if there's anybody interested in that, you can come up early and, and meet uh, meet some of the Rosies. Uh, November 3rd should be a cool one. That's going to be, uh, and I will totally butcher the guy's name, uh, Taras Lysenko. Uh, he was a worked on the recovery of a number of the aircraft out of Lake Michigan, and we'll be talking about the, the great Navy birds of Lake Michigan and how and the recovery. And then December 8th will be the final lecture for this, for this year, and uh, Colonel Fred Schwartz will be coming back and talking about tank destroyers. Uh, I think his, his presentation on the Sherman he did a couple years ago was probably one of our longest presentations. With the, I think it was almost three and a half hours long with the q and I think everybody had a good time with that one. So, uh, hopefully we'll all come for that. Uh, we have just a brief commercial. Uh, we had a huge, we've been working on a huge estate uh, that's donated and we're, we're cleaning the books out of it. Uh, so far we've pulled three, three, four truckloads of books out of this estate so far. Uh, that's what some of these are up here, which right now, if they're a dollar each, please buy as many as you can carry. Because I've got, we can't even turn around in the back room right now. There's so many books back there. Uh, we will be doing another, another large book sale. We just have to figure out where it fits in the calendar. So uh, I guess that's the last of my advertisements. So without further delay, uh, R.J. King will be talking about Detroit, the Engine of America. And uh, his presentation kind of ends where this museum picks up. So it'd be kind of cool with background about the, the city of Detroit. And how it got, uh, how we got here. So, Mr. King. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I don't know if this microwave microphone's working, but I don't know that we need it. It's working. Okay, good. Uh, well, um, my name is R.J. King. Uh, I'm uh, editor of Deep Business Magazine, which is a sister magazine to our Detroit. We also own Detroit Home, um, Bride, or excuse me, Weddings. And uh, in other markets, our Detroit is known as a lifestyle magazine, so we have lifestyle magazines in Los Angeles, Sacramento, Atlanta, Cincinnati, Palm Beach, Naples, um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, New York, uh, Mobile, Alabama. And, uh, we have about 150 magazines overall, uh, about 100 websites, um, and then a book publishing division and um, uh, some other assets, including the warehouse distribution facility called Target. Um, I grew up here, went to Brother Rice High School, uh, U of M Dearborn, graduated in 85 with an English degree, um, went to, um, uh, well, graduated from Brother Rice in 85 and then went to U of M Dearborn and graduated there in 1990. I was freelancing uh, during that time for suburban newspapers and so I was fortunate to get a job on the business staff at the Detroit News right out of school. In 1990, and stayed there for 16 years. Uh, wrote about 4,000 stories, uh, mostly on regional businesses, uh, sometimes upstate. And then um, in 2006, I left uh, and joined up with the Hour folks and launched uh, D Business Magazine, uh, 
Detroit Ancient of America is my most recent book. I've also uh, written and published a book called Mystical, which is three short stories of the same main characters. Um, there are paranormal investigators, two ladies. And then a book called Passport to the Corner Office, The Starter's Guide to Corporate Life here to high school, college and graduate students, and everything they need to know to, um, uh, to operate successfully in the corporate world. And then uh, another book called Eight Track, The First Mobile App, which is a period history book of the eight track tape player. Uh, as you may recall, it came out in 1965. Ford Motor Company was the very first one to ever offer the eight track tape player. And that uh, was a huge hit. It was the first mobile music experience that you could control uh, in a vehicle. And by 1970, it was a billion dollar industry. So that covers the period history of the player from 65 up to the early 80s. And then uh, this book that just came out, Detroit, Engine of America tells the story of how Detroit went from a French fort on the riverfront in 1701 uh, up to 1900, birthplace of the automotive industry. There's a lot of books out there and research material about what happened uh, with the growth of the automotive industry and our uh, contributions to uh, World War I, World War II, and the Korean War, and Vietnam, and, uh, and other uh, consumer products. But not a lot has been written about um, pre-1900 history in Detroit is, uh, I would say, the most unique history in the world. Um, the settlers, when they came here, led by Antoine de la Cadillac, uh, were uh, landed on July 24th, uh, 1701, and immediately started building a fort. There were Native American tribes in the area. But the area where downtown Detroit is now was kind of a big meta, and it was kind of a neutral hunting ground for the Indians. So. Uh, from that perspective, um, uh, we did experience Indian attacks, uh, but not as many as people might think. Um, and Cadillac had actually come in 1787 to, uh, yeah, uh, no, excuse me, eight, 1687 to actually scout uh, the area before they actually got uh, approval from King Louis XIV. And Count Pontchartrain was the finance minister. Pontchartrain, as you know, is a famous name in Detroit as well. And uh, the Ford is, uh, was where the 150 West Jefferson building is, so basically right across the street from Park Plaza. And uh, so just to back it up a little bit, the first chapter covers the period of 1600 to 1800. and talks about the four superpowers of Europe, France, Spain, English, and the Dutch. How the English and the Dutch settled the East Coast. Uh, the Spanish went down to got Florida and uh, the West Indies and Cuba and the French came up uh, St. Lawrence and uh, uh, founded Quebec and then Montreal. And then with Cadillac, they got into uh, Michigan, obviously Detroit, and then into Ohio and Kentucky. And that was all called New France. And that was kind of a buffer to keep the English and the Dutch from expanding too far westward. Uh, the settlers sustained themselves uh, in those early decades uh, through fishing, farming, and of course hunting which uh, obviously was propelled by the fur trade uh, that was going on globally, and that was a de facto currency uh, in and of itself, because in those days, silver and gold coins were pretty hard to come by. I mean, it wasn't like there was all these minting places uh, throughout Europe to mint these coins, so uh, the, even the soldiers sometimes were paid uh, with playing cards. They would cut them into four pieces and stamp the floor to be on there, and uh, that was uh, the equivalent of a, a currency. And uh, so, as I mentioned, fishing, farming, and hunting. And then uh, in the 1750s, we really got big into uh, shipbuilding and all kinds of different ships. Uh, everybody was hugging the river because to move passenger and freight, um, there were no real roads at that time. So uh, the French farmers, when they came, as you probably know, these ribbon farms, they uh, took away about 200 feet of uh, riverfront frontage and then would go two or three miles back. And so all these streets that you see that run from the river, Conant, Joseph Campo, Livernois, pretty much predominantly all named after French people. And those were French farmers back in the day. And then uh, 
farmers were also hugging the Rouge River, the Clinton River, and others, and everything sort of moved to what we know as downtown Detroit uh, for the trading, and those were all where all the general stores were. And then slowly but surely, the, the river got lined up with uh, obviously shipbuilding facilities, uh, but mills and foundries and, and all of those things. And then um, uh, just to, to keep walking you through, um, uh, then the, that all of a sudden that first chapter of 1600 to 1800, and then every chapter after that is by decade. It's 1800 to 1810, and so on up to 1900. And uh, we started to get into um, the building of agricultural parts, uh, hearths, uh, stoves. Uh, it was very difficult to get here prior to the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825. So the um, people had a portage here. Um, so the French obviously were here predominantly. Um, and then in the 1808-1810 period, uh, the Irish started to come in steady waves through the summer months. Um, predominantly because they were Catholic, the French were Catholic, the Irish were being persecuted on the East Coast uh, in a lot of different ways. And so getting here was sort of an oasis. They initially shared the French church um, and uh, slowly built their own. So they were the first immigrants, followed by the Germans and the uh, Polish people. And, and uh, many other nationalities, the Greeks and so on. And uh, when the Erie Canal opened uh, in 1825, people figured, figured out pretty quickly that uh, they needed a stove or a hearth to survive, obviously, the winters. So uh, at that time, upstate New York was the stove capital of the world, but people figured out pretty quickly they didn't need to uh, bring a, a stove on a barge through the Erie Canal to get to the eastern edge of Lake Ontario to get on a ship and then Lake Ontario to Lake Erie to get to uh, Detroit. So we quickly became the stove capital of the world. Um, and uh, the cover of the book, um, this skyline is from 1889 and obviously it's an etching and uh, very well done. I'm not sure of the artist. All the artwork in the book is from the 1800s but we could not find any of these artist names, but they are all, they are all referenced on where we got them. Quite a bit of the research came from John King Books and John John Detroit, uh, no relation to myself, but a very nice gentleman. And if you go on Saturday mornings, um, he's usually there. He can help you find things, show you off his rare book collection and all those types of things. So this symbol uh, on the book, we developed, uh, we call it the medallion, in uh, 1700 to 1900, and it shows how the settlers, you know, started building wagons and log homes and then ships and steamships, and then probably not well known, we built thousands of locomotives, thousands of rail cars and rail bars uh, because we have the industrial capacity. Uh, to put it in perspective, when Michigan became a state in 1837, Chicago became a city, so you can see how far ahead we were, everybody. Uh, so we built thousands of pieces of equipment for the railroad industry that were used all over the country. And then finally, the horse's carriage in uh, 1896, first driven in March of that year by a gentleman, uh, Charles Brady King. Again, no relation. Uh, <laughs> but he uh, was followed that uh, March evening. Uh, he, was, he went up and down Woodward and a little bit of Jefferson. Uh, and that was it. He did it uh, sort of around 11 o'clock at night, so not to disturb the horses or anything. And, uh, we, uh, uh, and uh, trailing him uh, on that ride on a bicycle was a young engineer by the name of Henry Ford. A few months later, Henry Ford came out with his quadricycle, uh, which looks very similar to that. And um, some of the parts and components from uh, Henry Ford's vehicle came from Charles Brady King, who was his mentor. Uh, and so this, uh, each of these vehicles, uh, the quadrants here, uh, reference the spokes on that vehicle, and then we gave this area a pearlesque effect uh, to kind of make a cop off the page. Uh, so that's what that symbol is, and then when uh, I'm signing the books, uh, we had some stamps made up by a company in Plymouth, we try to keep everything in the state, and we stamp it there, and then sign it, and then you get your choice of uh, a 
black or a red color in terms of the stamp. Um, now, uh, with that backdrop, uh, I should also mention that the book, in addition to uh, explain how this industrial powerhouse was developed in the middle of the wilderness and how we were blessed by natural resources uh, that helped propel and grow. Uh, it also explains all of the interesting characters along the way, uh, starting with Cadillac and some of his early men, um, who, like I said, started building the fort the day they arrived on July 24th, 1701. Two days later, on the Feast of St. Anne, uh, they established St. Anne's Church, and as you know, the seventh, seventh iteration of that church is now by the Ambassador Bridge, uh, and they're going to be announcing a big capital campaign uh, in the coming months. And then on the third day, they started the first tavern. Detroit was the big drinking town. Um, you had to have things like French brandy to attract men who would hunt. Uh, they also traded with the Indians for that. Uh, Cadillac was an innovator. He was the first one to hire the Indians to go out and get the furs. Before that, the merchants of Quebec and Montreal, who were his competitors, um, they went and loaded up boats and they would go find, uh, they would go meet with the Native American tribes and then trade back and forth. It was obviously a slower process. So, with the Cadillac in the first two or three years, he started flooding the market with furs, really upset the merchants. Um, but the merchants controlled a lot of the supplies that were coming in from Europe, and uh, they would start charging higher prices to Detroit. Obviously, um, a lot of um, animosity uh, which in those days. And uh, finally, um, the Quebec uh, merchants convinced Fort Pontchartrain uh, to take away some of the Cadillac's um, uh, duties and start reducing the uh, fur trade, and Cadillac had nothing to do with it. So they decided to hold a trial up in Quebec, and as soon as uh, Cadillac got there in 1704, they arrested him. He stayed in jail for a few months before Pontchartrain arrived, and it took a whole year to resolve this matter. And uh, he finally got everything, pretty much everything, back that he wanted. At that time, France was setting up this um, colony uh, trade company to try to uh, organize everything. And, um, and uh, Cadillac came back and pretty much went back into what he was doing before with the Native Americans Americans, you know, getting as much money as he could uh, for himself and others. And it really did help the city grow and the fort to grow, I should say, in those days. Uh, but finally, things came to a head in 1710, and Count Pontchartrain uh, thanked Cadillac for his services in Detroit and then recommissioned him to New Orleans, and that was the last time Cadillac was ever in Detroit. And eventually, he moved back to France and uh, passed away. He um, had 13 children, three of whom were still alive when he passed, I believe, in uh, 1731. Um, and so, uh, the first war, and I thought because we're here today in, in the theme of the museum, I would talk about the five conflicts that either Detroit was indirectly involved in or affected by in a major way. Uh, and that latter statement would refer to the Seven Year War, um, which uh, started in the late 1750s and uh, went to 1763, and it pitted England, France, Spain, and the Dutch. And what happened was the English beat them all. So they ruled the world, so to speak, and um, the uh, French, New France, was turned over to Britain at that time. And so in 1763, we went from being uh, French-ruled uh, outpost to British rule outpost. Now it didn't happen overnight. You had to get uh, the British uh, people there. So I thought I'd read uh, an initial passage about uh, how that affected Detroit. Uh, as time went on, glo global nation building eventually changed the course of Detroit from the so-called Seven Years' War from 1754 to 1763. It actually took nine years, but 
call it Seven Year War, it really is. Uh, the British attacked the French in Quebec and Montreal and defeated Spain by conquering Havana in 1762. And after the resulting settlement in late 1763, France surrendered New France, including Fort Pontchartrain, to the British, while the Spanish lost control of portions of the Gulf of Mexico. Soon after, the Detroit garrison in the new Northwest Territory and its inventory of furs, estimated to be worth $500,000, was renamed Fort Detroit, so no longer Fort Pontchartrain. At the outset, the British expanded the fort to provide for 80 more homes. In turn, Dutch agents of the Mohawk began to send dozens of trading boats every year from the east from April to October. Uh, in Detroit, the English saw the fort as its center of operations in the west and quickly made it a major trade market. So again, uh, something that happened to Detroit that just accelerated its growth that would normally have been occurring um, if they had been left to their own devices. Uh, and then with one or two portages from Albany, the Dutch traders reached the lakes and then in their large open boats they coasted along the shores of Ontario and Erie until they reached this, the most famous trading post in the West. Cyrus Farmer writes, who's a historian, uh, they brought goods of every kind wrapped in tarpaulins and oiled skins so extensive was the traffic and so sharp the competition that only the most wide awake of men had any chance of success. Uh, as time went on and the British arrived, um, the Native Americans didn't really like them. Uh, the French were pretty nice to them and um, uh, the British not so much. And so um, there were uh, major battles between the British and the Indians and uh, Chief Pontiac at this time uh, was really a nuisance to the British, and uh, you might know the um, the massacre of uh, Bloody Run, which is uh, uh, a cemetery now on the uh, east side of Detroit. But uh, Cadillac and his men had lured the uh, British troop over there and uh, basically surprised them, and ambushed them. And, uh, this was going on, and eventually they made peace. Um, so basically that uh, was the first war that affected Detroit. The next one, of course, is the War of Independence for America. And into the early, 1970s, early 1770s, rising taxes and the conversion to English currency, both in Detroit and across the colonies, <coughs> contributed to the resentment of British rule. When the Revolutionary War broke out, it was clear the Patriots could take on the English alone. At the start, British ships controlled the eastern Atlantic seaboard to prevent foreign troops and supplies from aiding the colonies. To put the British on the defensive, <coughs> France and the Netherlands sent some of their largest warships to fly through openings in the blockade in an effort to supply needed troops, armaments, and food to the Patriots. Spain, meanwhile, spent two years attacking the British garrisons along the Gulf of Mexico. Once the Mississippi River was secured, the Spanish and other European nations, along with private merchants, opened trade with the colonists along and near the Mississippi River, exchanging weapons and gunpowder for tobacco, cotton, and other commodities, essentially filling up back lines. Uh, with most of the con fighting concentrated in the eastern colonies, the British moved to establish Detroit as the capital of the Northwest Territory, which included at that time Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Uh, and that was a, a bid to raise revenue and backfill supplies in the East. Um, and then uh, at 1778, uh, the British commander, Lenoy, uh, decided it was high time that a new fort be built. Uh, the first one, you know, had been going for uh, almost 80 years. And uh, it was basically falling apart, and so they built a new fort. Uh, basically, if you know where the U.S. District Courthouse is in downtown Detroit, at Fort and Shelby, and I'll <coughs> talk about that in a, in a few minutes, uh, that's where the second fort was. The first fort was just, you know, demolished. The second fort uh, was built up on a hill at that moat, much better protected. Uh, the cannons were more advanced. They could reach uh, across the shoreline to the Canadian side. 
uh, and then um, the uh, settlers and the residents of Detroit. Uh, there was a larger area that uh, a blockade or a, you know fencing was built for them. Uh, you know, fort was built for them, so everybody sort of huddled inside uh, when needed. And then the farmers were kind of on their own, and if they saw an attack, they would obviously rush to the fort. Um, and then, uh, you know, because of the assistance of France, especially um, the Spanish and the Dutch, uh, we were able to beat the British in, uh, in 1782, <coughs> recognizing the human and economic toll on England, King George III directed a settlement be made with the colonies, along with France, Spain, and the Netherlands. From the Treaty of Paris in 1783, the colonies and all of the English forts in the Northwest Territory would be transferred to the Americans. As some measure of revenge from their loss in the Seven Years' War, France and its two European allies achieved their collective goal of aiding the colonies to weaken the Royal Navy and remove Britain's ability to tax merchants and citizens. Rather than continue the fight, King George III set the foundation for future economic trade between England and the merchant colonies. As it played out, the United States controlled land along the Atlantic Ocean, stretching from north uh, from Florida, east from the Mississippi River, and south of Canada. Uh, quote, I was the last to consent to the separation King George III relayed in 1785 to then American minister to London, John Adams. But the separation having been made and having become inevitable, I have always said, as I say now, that I would be the first to meet the friendship of the United States as an independent power. So, 1782, 1783, 1784, 1785, we won that war. We don't get Detroit back into, or into American hands until 1796. The reason is, is because the British uh, with their relations with some of the Indian tribes that were friendly to them, continued on with these Indian wars and they would attack colonists. Um, Detroit was never attacked, but other places were. And uh, eventually, um, General Anthony Wayne, uh, who was actually a major general, uh, was largely uh, one of the most successful uh, generals in that era. And uh, finally, when that was settled, uh, uh, via the Treaty of was it Kent? In any event, Fall uh, Timbers maybe. Pardon? Fall on Timbers maybe. Treaty of Kent. Yeah, Treaty of Kent. Thank you. And um, after that was done, uh, a few weeks later, in summer of uh, 1796. Um, American Colonel Jean Francis Hamtramck, along with 300 soldiers, arrived at Fort Lenore uh, in mid-July, and some 500 residents lived inside the settlement. All scores of logs home, log homes and barns were located near the river. A few weeks later, his commander, Major General Mad Anthony Wayne, who was in charge of the Western Army, American Army, and had won battles during the Northwest Indian War, arrived in Detroit. To commemorate his military success, Wayne County was named for the Major General, while in 1827, one of four townships was named after Ham Tramick, who would eventually become a city in 1922. At the time Wayne County was formed, it covered a large swath of the Northwest Territory. But Major General Wayne's stay was short-lived due to his death from gout in late 1796. Uh, the British didn't leave. Um, without showing their spite against the Americans. And uh, they locked the gates of the fort, broke the windows in the barracks, and filled the wells with stones, uh, just to be spiteful. <laughs> so uh, the fort was renamed uh, Fort Detroit. And uh, so then uh, that concludes the first chapter. And then, as I said, we get into uh, the next section of the book, and it's the next 10 chapters, or by decade, 1800 to, uh, up to, right up to 1900. And um, uh, we went through the Great Fire of 1805, which uh, 
most likely was deliberately set. Um, General Hall, who was in charge of the um, Northwest Territory, came here after the fire and determined that um, it had been deliberately set and that somebody had uh, gobbled up all the future contracts that year for timber from all the mills. And so he canceled all those contracts and said that by permit, if he needed wood, uh, he had to come through his office. And that gave them uh, the year's time that uh, the three territorial judges, uh, which included Judge uh, Augustus B. Woodward, um, Woodward largely set the uh, uh, streets, the planning of the streets, um, and it was a plan that borrowed from Paris and borrowed from Washington, D.C., but it was unique to Detroit. Now, uh, a lot of people think, oh, those streets were just built right away. No. It took time. The first major street was Atwater, obviously right at the water, so pretty easy to figure out where that was. And then Jefferson uh, came next, and then Woodward eventually came next. And uh, by uh, 1808, there were 300 new buildings, uh, and so the city was well on its way to going through its next spurt of growth. Uh, and now the next chapter we get to 18. 10 to 1820, and uh, we come to what's sometimes referred to as the uh, Second War of Independence. Um, on June 18th, 1812, the United States declared war against England, Ireland, Canada, and Britain's North American colonies, uh, and Native Americans therefore aligned with the British reasons for what is referred to as America's Second War of Independence was due largely to rising trade restrictions set by Britain during its war with Napoleonic France. The British sought to keep America's growing maritime fleet from aiding the enemy and ordered that all Allied goods be routed to England where they would be inspected for armaments. The Americans saw the order as a direct threat to their ability to freely conduct international trade. Uh, the U.S. also sought to secure the release of 10,000 American merchant sailors who had been commandeered by the Royal Navy. In turn, the British continued to encourage Native American tribes to attack U.S. settlements. The war, which lasted two and a half years, was fought mostly in the U.S. with Detroit, a French town, which is Monroe, uh, Fort Malden, and Lake Erie serving as the sites of key land and Navy battles. Um, and, uh, you know, this tide started to turn in the Americans' favor. Um, uh, the following year, and uh, mostly to the uh, great foresight of uh, General Perry, uh, excuse me, uh, U.S. Master Commandant Oliver Hazen, Hazer Perry, uh, who won a major battle in uh, Lake Erie, which I think know a lot about, um, and uh, I can read a little bit about that. In the early summer, Perry, um, he had spent that winter uh, building ships on the uh, eastern edge of Lake Ontario uh, to prepare for major battles with the British that summer. And in the early of that summer, Perry sailed for Putin Bay, a small island <coughs> in southwestern Lake Erie. And in anticipation of a major naval battle, uh, Perry asked that a special flag be used when signaling the start of the fight. Sewn by a group of local women, the flag used the dying words of Perry's friend, Captain James Lawrence, don't give up the ship. On September 10th, Perry saw British commander Robert Barclay's ship sail by his position at Putin Bay. Perry and his nine vessels attacked Barclay's fleet of six ships, which consisted of two large armed vessels, one brig, two schooners, and a sloop. Based on wind and distance, Perry's ship, the Lawrence, came under attack, while his other large vessel, the Niagara, was held back from the fray and fired long-range cannon shots. In short order, the Lawrence was destroyed. Under heavy fire, Perry and a handful of men dropped a boat on the backside of the ship and rowed a half mile to the Niagara. From there, Perry took control and ordered all his ships to attack the British fleet, 
with Perry holding an upper hand in terms of firepower and the position of his fleet. The British eventually surrendered. Following the battle, Perry wrote on the back of an envelope and directed the message to General Harrison. We have met the enemy, and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop. Um, and then, you know, we went on to win the war. Uh, if you've been to the uh, Western Blue Cadillac Hotel, you come out the front doors and you see uh, General Macomb uh, out front in the island of Washington Boulevard. Uh, Macomb and some others have fought battles. Uh, they were from Detroit, but fought battles uh, in upstate New York. Uh, around the Buffalo area. And they, uh, again, did their homework uh, over that uh, winter of uh, 1813. They went into the forest uh, at the bottom of, uh, uh, it was a large lake there. And um, the British were at the top, and we were at the bottom. We built roads that went into the forest, and then uh, a little ways into those roads, they were just narrow narrow, 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 to the point that they just stopped. And then our men were there and they would just ambush the British. And then some sea battles, uh, we were very fortunate there. Uh, so that statue of Macomb that you see outside of Bocala, uh, was, uh, it's incredibly dense because it was actually made from melting down the cannons from that war. There's actually two cannons from the war of 1812 like that. Um, so, uh, the great news was we thankfully won the War of 1812. Uh, Detroit had been surrendered by Governor Hall. Uh, he had feared for the safety of women and children. He was somewhat surrounded, the British uh, from Fort Walden, which was in Amherstburg, uh, Canada. Uh, they uh, came up from uh, the south, excuse me, they came up from the west, and then they positioned cannons on the uh, Canadian side and started bombarding the plant. And then um, the British had to align themselves with uh, uh, Chief Tecumseh, and he came in from the north part, which was probably the weakest area of our, our fort at the time, Fort Detroit. And uh, Governor Hall, Hall set up the surrender flag uh, almost right away, asked for five days to settle everything, gave them three hours. And uh, so uh, most everything went on as normal. Uh, they tried to hire Judge Woodward uh, to help run things. He refused. Uh, Gabriel Richard, father of Gabriel Richard, who came here in 1798, he also refused to work for the British. Um, they eventually locked up Richard. They sent Woodward to the uh, East Coast for a while. Um, so we won, and, and that's really uh, another point of growth for the city. Uh, now you start seeing things like um, more agricultural equipment being built, these hearths, um, all kinds of kitchen utensils, and everything that uh, could sustain and grow the population. Uh, the University of Michigan was founded in Detroit on Bates Street in 1817. Uh, by people like uh, Gabriel Bouchard, who was the early founder, uh, as well as uh, Louis Cass, <laughs> who was appointed governor of uh, the territory at that time. And uh, slowly but surely, we kept growing, we kept growing. And then, the, as I mentioned earlier, the opening of the um, Erie Canal uh, in 1845 greatly uh, accelerated uh, the number of people that came here. Uh, because again, uh, we were talking about villages that existed in places like Toledo and Cleveland and others. Um, and I need to back up a minute because I did miss a point. At the end of the War of 1812, um, a uh, Governor Shelby from Kentucky had answered a call from Detroit for a thousand men. He came with two thousand. And up the Thames River on the Canadian side, they chased the last of the remaining British fleet, along with Chief Tecumseh. Uh, Chief Tecumseh and his right hand guy were killed. So that sent a message to a lot of people that, you know, this thing was over and the British having surrendered. So, in, uh, in their huge uh, gratitude, uh, Fort 
Detroit was renamed Fort Shelby. So whenever you're downtown Detroit and you see you're at the convergence of Ford Street, which runs uh, parallel to the river, and Shelby Street, um, that was where that second fort was. And there's a uh, historical marker on the U.S. District Courthouse that explains that as well. Uh, so that's how we became Fort Shelby. And a lot of people don't realize that those streets were uh, really useful back in the day. Yes. Uh, one thing you might want to consider too is, and I know it's not necessarily history of Detroit, but when Detroit did fall in 1812, uh, the main fortress left to the Americans was uh, uh, just south of Toledo, uh, Ferrisburg. Uh, Fort Biggs. Fort Biggs. Uh, Fort Biggs suffered two sieges uh, during that period, during the War of 1812, um, and fell in the time. Uh, the commander at that time was General William Henry Harrison, and his engineer was a gentleman by the name of Henry Gratian, who turned out to be the district military engineer of that for that time, and that's, I suspect, who Gratian Avenue was made for. Yeah, uh, that's in the book. I didn't get into that detail, but I thought that. Thank you. Um, and then after, as I said, uh, with the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825 that accelerated Detroit's growth, uh, it was so busy during the summer season that people had to stay on their ships until suitable housing could be found. Um, and then, uh, we, we grew uh, quite rapidly, and then um, in 17, excuse me, in 1861, uh, the Confederate Army fired on Fort Sumter, and uh, now we're off into the, uh, the Civil War. Um, and uh, in the lead up to the war, President James Buchanan, a pacifist, sought to reach a peace treaty with the Southern states. Uh, Lewis Cass, who served as Secretary of State, resigned from the cabinet in protest. At 78 years old, he said of his departure, they had seen the Constitution born and now feared he was seeing it die. Answering President Abraham Lincoln's call for soldiers in May of 1861, the state's first regiment traveled to Washington, D.C. Upon their arrival, Lincoln was so moved that he welcomed the troops with open arms and said, thank God for Michigan. Um, over time, Detroit sent thousands of men to join the Union Army, and the draft was held for the first time in 1864. Uh, the Michigan troops, which were predominantly Detroit, uh, Detroiters, included 30 infantry regiments, 11 cavalry regiments, two light batteries, two companies of sharpshooters, one light artillery regiment, and the first Michigan engineers. Among the divisions was the 24th Michigan Voluntary Infantry, which was assigned to the Iron Brigade and the Army of the Potomac. Uh, the company's first action was at the Battle of Fredericksburg, where it took out a Confederate battery. It went on to fight at the Battle of Gettysburg, where 363 of its officers and men were killed, wounded, or captured. It was the worst period of the war for Michigan shoulders, shoulders who went on to fight in the Battle of Chancellorville, Wilderness, uh, Spiesvania, uh, Cold Harbor, and the Siege of Petersburg, among others. Uh, leading the 1st, 5th, 6th, and 7th Michigan Cavalry, often referred to as the Wolverine Brigade, was Brigadier General George Armstrong Custer, who was born in Ohio and grew up in Monroe. Away from the battlefields, uh, the mayor of Detroit and his cabinet would receive word from time to time that a plot was being formed to take over Detroit, but nothing materialized. The war generated substantial war contracts, and local manufacturers produced machine tools, rifles, railroad equipment, weapons, leather goods, and agricultural goods. The production of factories in the North helped break the economy of the southern states, while, which at the outset of the war produced two-thirds of the world's supply of cotton. The South had little in the way of manufacturing facilities, 
uh, operating 29% of the railroad tracks and 13% of the nation's banks. According to the National Park Service, the northern states produce 3,200 firearms for every 100 made in the south, and Detroit played a very important role in that. Uh, when word reached the city on April 10, 1865, that General Robert E. Lee had surrendered the Confederate Army, quote, the announcement caused almost complete, the almost complete suspension of business, and the joy of the citizens found expression in speeches, processions, and illuminations, wrote historian Silas Farmer, but joy was soon turned to mourning. For the on the morning of April 15th, the city was startled with the news that President Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated. The whole city was at once mourning. Men wept like little children, and intense feelings pervaded all classes. The 24th Michigan Voluntary Army was assigned to escort Lincoln's funeral train. Um, and I think this passage is very telling of the spirit of Detroit. As a measure to get past their grief, Reverend George Taylor, agent of the Christian Commission, suggested the city greet the returning soldiers with an elaborate dinner. Quote, notices were sent to the churches calling for provisions, money, and helpers from the road. A public meeting was held and arrangements perfected with Mr. Taylor's manager. Scores of ladies, both from Detroit and places in the interior, volunteered to serve the tables, and when the regiments arrived, the men were welcomed and waited upon. The upper part of the freight depot of the Michigan Consolidated Railroad was fitted up as a dining hall with seats for 1,000 persons, and between June 4th, 1865, and June 10th, 1866, more than 23,000 men were received and entertained. Wow. Um, and uh, the other uh, interesting point of the Civil War and, and prior to its start was the fact that uh, Ulysses S. Grant lived in Detroit from 1849 to 1851. Uh, he was commissioned to Fort Wayne, which had been built in the 1840s. Um, and uh, the officers' quarters weren't ready yet. So he lived just outside the fort, the <coughs> fort in Liverdoy. Uh, with his wife and small girl, uh, he was uh, warned early on by a minister not to drink, and he didn't. They were largely the toast of the town, invited to every uh, ball and event, and uh, he had the fastest horse. He was a great horseman. Uh, unfortunately, he was transferred to upstate Maine uh, in 1851. I think just through sheer boredom, uh, in his own vices, he started drinking again, and then they transferred him clear across the country to Portland. Imagine what it would take to get from Maine to Portland in those days. Uh, Intercontinental Railroad wasn't ready yet. Uh, but in any event, uh, he was caught drinking on the job while in Portland. He was given the choice of either resigning his commission or being court-martialed, he resigned his commission. And then in 1861, when the war broke out, uh, he convinced the governor of Illinois to give him um, control of a regiment, a uh, brigade. And uh, the great thing about Grant was he fought. He didn't care about politics, he just fought. And some of the other generals under Lincoln were biding their time, trying to uh, angle their way to win the 1864 presidential election. Grant had nothing to do with that. And that's how he worked his way up to the head of the U.S. Army. When the war was over, in the summer of 1865, he returned to Detroit for a five-day hero's welcome, and then of course went on to uh, become president of the United States. Um, after the war, uh, and, uh, after the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Civil War, our economy went up, and unlike the end of World War II, that industrialization that we built up, the industrial uh, manufacturing that we built up to support those three wars, we were able to keep and keep growing. And uh, very quickly, to make that point uh, home and how it affected today, after the war, uh, after the World War II, we had basically doubled our industrial output to make all the tanks and the planes and the munitions that you know, around display here, 
Um, and that collapsed our economy. There was no Marshall Plan for Detroit, I think there should have been, to help tear down those factories that weren't being used. And in 1950, when the economy finally started to recover, that's when people started moving to the suburbs because mom and dad didn't want their kids growing up next to an empty factory. Uh, Detroit, as it grew as an industrial powerhouse, uh, the industrial facilities would be built just on the outskirts of where people were living, and then they would quickly be surrounded by neighborhoods because the people had to walk to work. And that kept going and going and going and going. And the reason the tank plant is at a uh, 12 mile, 13 mile uh, off the mound was because that was the only open land that they could find. It's 11 and a half, it's 11 and a half in, in Van Dyke. Sure. And it used to cover a whole square. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's built out there and it had the big test trap and all those things. Um, test so, track gone. Pardon? Test track gone, plant shut down. Sure. Uh, there's a historical marker there and that's that side of the area that uh, that uh, the plant is on is turned over to commercial concern now. Okay. So finally the Civil War Academy uh, accelerated even more um, beyond uh, building all these uh, uh, locomotives and rail cars and agricultural equipment and everything. We really got uh, in the 1850s, we really got um, uh, great proficiency in building marine engines. And uh, at the end of the 1890s, when the automotive industry started to take off, um, not only did we have the industrial might to build the engines and the forest uh, to build the bodies. Obviously, there was lots of coach builders here. And you know the names, the Fisher family, the Dodge brothers were bicycle makers. Uh, you know, the Durant family were coach makers. Um, you know, that all uh, uh, in combination with a skilled labor force was the result, or the result was that we became the birthplace of the uh, Made, uh, automotive industry. Uh, and then there was one final conflict uh, that uh, closes uh, almost the end of the book, and uh, I'll just read it. Uh, the lead up to the outbreak of the Spanish American War that liberated Cuba from Spain was the dominant international news story of the day. Uh, the United States had been relatively quiet in global affairs up to this time, but with the economic panic of 1893 and the rearview mirror and the growing influence of newspapers, the war thrust the country into the international arena. The conflict got its start when the USS Maine entered Havana Air Harbor in January 1898. Within three weeks, the ship was destroyed in an explosion. In late March, a U.S. Navy investigation determined an outside explosive set beneath the hull ignited the ship's powder magazines, though no definitive evidence was offered. The loss of 250 of 355 U.S. Soul sailors on board the USS Maine was met with outrage. Further revulsion was generated when, in a bid to exact greater control of Cuban citizens, Spanish, Spain's governor of Cuba, General Valeriano Weiler Nicolai, the so-called butcher, ordered rural residents to move to central locations. The resulting crowding led to the death of thousands of Cuban citizens from starvation and diseases, especially yellow fever. The news coverage of the day, which included the incitement of war from newspapers controlled by William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, led to a period of what was called yellow journalism, or news coverage that was exaggerated and sensationalized with little factual information. I think we're in that period right now. Yes. Uh, war was declared against Spain in late April, uh, and National Guard units around the country were called to training. In Detroit, thousands of people lined Woodward Avenue to view the Michigan National Guard as they marched to Union Depot. From there, the men boarded trains bound for Camp Eaton at Island Lake near Brighton for formal training. Governor Hazen Pingree, who was previously mayor of Detroit, was a regular visitor to the camp and even traveled with some of the men assigned to defend Americans, America's eastern and southern borders. In total, 7,000 men from Michigan served in the war. 
which lasted 10 weeks. Most were assigned to level and widen Cuba's narrow and muddy roads, while several hundred soldiers, including more than 200 men who, were, who served aboard the USS Yosemite, served on U.S. naval ships that were in a blockade formation. Local coverage of the war dominated the front pages of nearly every newspaper, and there were numerous articles about Commander William H. Emery, a former Michigan naval militiaman who served as captain of the USS Yosemite. His officers included, you'll recognize these names, Edwin C. Denby, uh, Denby High School was named after him, Truman H. Newberry, who went on to become a U.S. Senator representing Michigan, Henry B. Joy, uh, future president of the Packard Motor Car Company in Detroit, and R. Thornton Broadhead, whom the Detroit Naval Army near Belle Isle was named after. Another favorite point of coverage was the USS Detroit. Launched in 1891, uh, it saw action in the bombardment of several forts and shore batteries in that war. Uh, in Detroit's Navy, a brief history of the U.S. Navy Reserve and the Michigan Naval Militia in Southeast Michigan, Dan Eaton writes, on June 28, 1898, while on blockade duty at San Juan, Puerto Rico, the Yosemite operating independently and under heavy enemy fire from the shore and three enemy gunboats attacked the Spanish ship SS Antonio Lopez that was attempting to run the blockade. In an hours long battle, the Yosemite withstood heavy enemy fire and scored numerous direct hits on the Antonio Lopez, rendering the enemy ship inoperable and eventually run aground. Due to the actions of the Yosemite, during what later came to be known as the Third Battle of San Juan, the blockade held and the U.S. maintained control of the high seas. Um, and, uh, let's see if I time in here. Oh, we're just after three o'clock. Um, so those were the five conflicts that uh, Detroit and Michigan uh, went through in that period from 1700 to uh, 1900. Um, and in addition to uh, being a city building book, it probably went from a fort to this industrial powerhouse. Uh, you learned about all the interesting characters along the way, some of which I've mentioned, like Lewis Cass, Father Gabriel Richard, but also people like uh, Bernhard Stroh, um, uh, R.L. Polk, Ellen Scripps, and her family that started the Evening News that became the Detroit News. Um, obviously, Mayor Hayes and Pingree, uh, who uh, owned a, a shoe operation. He, he uh, was born on the East Coast, um, entered the Civil War, came to Detroit afterward, and uh, built up a very nice shoe business, traveled the country. And um, in the uh, 1885 period, a major strike occurred against his business. And he said that that experience, which lasted a year or two, converted him from being a pure uh, corporate titan to a uh, benefactor of the common man. And uh, when he became mayor in 1889, um, he was uh, sort of the people's mayor, if you will. And during the great economic panic of 1893, he allowed citizens to farm city of lots, and he gained the nickname Potato Patch uh, Angry. His statue, as you may know, was in uh, Grand Circus Park on the uh, west side of Woodward. And his arch enemy, uh, Mayor Mayberry, is on the east side, and they both almost relegated each other. So, uh, <laughs> they probably don't like that too much. That'll work. <laughs> uh, uh, but that's uh, that's my presentation today, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'll be signing books afterward. We'll do a little Q and A if anybody would like. The books are uh, twenty nine ninety five, and we can take a cash uh, credit card or checks, and uh, they make great gifts, obviously, with the holidays coming up. And uh, it's a very durable book. We designed it um, with rounded corners, uh, hardcover, printed uh, design on it. It's very durable. Also has a red uh, page mark ribbon at the bottom. Um, so it's uh, going to last forever, pretty much. Uh,
So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll just open it up to questions. Yes, sir. So you mentioned Cleveland and, and, and Toledo and, and Buffalo. They came later, I would. So is that one of the reasons why they, I mean, they, they're, you know, Cleveland was a good industrial city, but at the time, back in the, in the 1800s, um, was it more because Detroit was really settled first and, and was more established and, and that, I mean, things happened in Cleveland, of course, and Buffalo as well later on, but it's, sure. was it more attributed to Detroit being first settled than more of those other ones? Or? Yeah, I would just invite you to put it in perspective. So Detroit's older than the country. Right. By 80 years, however you want to cover that. Right. We're the oldest city in the Midwest, so we're older than Chicago, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Cleveland, even Pittsburgh. Right. Uh, Buffalo is obviously ahead of us. Um, but because of that, when, uh, when that uh, movement westward first started um, after the Revolutionary War, Detroit was really the only place to come. And as uh, the historians um, touted, uh, on the East Coast, Detroit had this, there was very much a celebrated frontier town. This was the place to come sort of a utopia. Uh, anybody that wanted to, you know, it was not the best living conditions in places like New York and Boston. Um, it was still pretty rough. People were pretty tight-knit together. Uh, it was pretty rough. Yeah. So to get out of there and come to a more frontier town was a big appeal. You also have to realize, too, that when uh, Detroit, uh, the only thing that's older than Detroit, I think, is Sault Ste. Marie and Mackinac. Yes, that's right. That's where the French started. Uh, Pontiac Rebellion actually, uh, there's two places in Michigan that were figured, that figured in that. Uh, one was uh, the fort at Mackinac, which actually was Mission Millie Mackinac at that point. Uh, and uh, Detroit. I believe at the time Detroit was uh, Detroit was under the command of Robert Rogers, who what was the uh, what year was that? Rogers Rangers, seventeen sixty three. Uh, he might have been the uh, the commander at that time. because uh, the the way. Pontiac, uh, Pontiac's people got a hold of Mission Millie Mackinac <coughs> by means of the game of what they call what what turn is now uh, more like a cross. Uh, and what they did is they threw the ball over the walls of the fort, and then the and then the Indian and then the Indians ran in to catch the ball, quote unquote. Well, while they were doing that, the women were right, right there, and they they grabbed weapons as they were going into the fort and got the fort by it good old fashioned subterfuge. And they tried the same thing at Detroit, if I understand correctly. And unfortunately for the Indians, the word had come down of what happened. There one of the there was some survivors and they got word down at Detroit just about in time. Uh, to prevent it. So what uh, Rogers did is basically he he uh, basically shut the, door, shut the gates at that point. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, Calic was actually the commander of Fort Michigan back on, uh, prior to Detroit. Uh, well, it was British, if Michigan Lily Mackinac at that point was under British, under British control. We were saying early. 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 Yeah. Early. Yeah. That's good. Well, they, they Michelin and Mackinac actually, yeah, you're right. It was basically British, French, and uh, it was right after, it was after that that the, the British built Fort Mackinac up on Mackinac Island so that the Indians couldn't get, it, it made it harder for them to get, to get there, basically. Okay. Yes, sir. Do you, do you go into more detail on the development of the different industries, though? I mean, oh, so, yes. Yeah. Tobacco, tobacco industry. Uh, that uh, cigar, beginning of the last chapter. Okay. Uh, so that would be in the early 1890s. 
uh, the beer industry. Um, Refriger you talked about rail cars, like supposedly the refrigerated rail cars. Yep. 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 To volunteer. How about Carhartt? Which one? Carhartt. Carhartt, yes. Okay. 18, uh, 89. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joseph. Carhartt, him and his uncle started that business. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's, they're in there. Uh, as well as many others. Yes, sir. What would you say would be the economy kind of went from basically like a fur trading to start? Was it that oven period where we started to become industrial more? Uh, was there a certain period that we, we switched from fur trading to something else? Or we're always probably big at fur trading here, I mean, for a while. But at some point, was it the oven or the locomotive era or? It, it, was, started it would have been the period after the War of 1812. Uh -huh. um, we started to really uh, solidify our industrial output and start to grow. The hearth um, was first before the stoves. The hearth was just a small little stove. So typically, those old pictures you see them in the middle of a room. Uh, you know, they were about yay big, the pipe going up about the ceiling, and you know, people would gather around there and stay warm. Uh, yeah. And then over time, the the stove type yeah, but those. Those hearths were very difficult to cook with. Uh, and so the stove uh, obviously developed from that. But uh, yeah, like I said, we became the stove capital. But we had foundries for that, and then the foundries just evolved into, into making stove parts and stoves and, mm -hmm. and eventually everything else. Right? Yeah. Okay. yeah, and the shipbuilding continued up sure. throughout uh, as well, um, throughout the 1900, or 1800s. Uh, so we had all that going. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can see all the industrial <coughs> activity that was going on from this 1889 scene. Um, and you can clearly see here Grand Circus Park. Um, the Central Methodist Church was still there, built in 1862. Uh, the longest operating clock tower as well in the city. And then St. John Episcopal Church is right there. And, and I haven't really been able to find anything else that's still standing for this uh, uh, etching. <laughs> I imagine the Rouge River was named by the French. I think Rouge means red in French. Yes, French. yes. yes that's so the French was, that, that during the French time, they probably named that. <laughs> yes, sir. Grand Circus Park was also the place where they held the largest rallies for replacements during the Civil War of. Uh, uh, recruitment rallies, mm -hmm. especially when they were trying to recruit for more people from the Iron Brigade. Sure, um, and campus marches as well. Yeah. Yes, and that's also, where they must. I think campus marches is where they mustered out. <coughs> right, and campus marches in Latin is refers to as parade runs. Right. Uh, one thing you may want to uh, talk in the back of your mind, um, Philip Sheridan, the cavalry general. Uh, he got his start, if you will. He was a captain of infantry at the beginning of the Civil War and got an appointment from Governor Austin Blair of the state of Michigan to command the 7th Michigan Cavalry. And it was from there that he rose. Uh, he was, Sheridan was uh, involved in an engagement at Boonville, Mississippi with the 7th, almost got himself cut off and destroyed, but was able to avert that and uh, defeat the, the Confederate Brigade that was sent against him. <coughs> but that was as a result of the, uh, well, not Corinth, but uh, Shiloh. Okay at that point, and also Michigan troops played a significant uh, role at Shiloh okay. Thank you. as well. Any other uh, questions? Okay, well thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. I can personally sign the books anyway. Do I have permission? Yeah.